I want to do something a little unusual this week and provide a content trigger warning for my conversation with Dr. Stacia Dearman. I'm going to talk to her about her personal experience walking through a malpractice claim and lawsuit pursuant to an adverse patient outcome. It's pretty emotionally intense, and I'm very grateful for Dr. Dearman for her candor in this discussion. I think this is a really important topic. It's one that is not frequently discussed with physicians until they're, they find themselves in the midst of this situation. So I'm eager to share this, but just want to let you know if you're running on the treadmill at the gym or something and you find yourself in this circumstance, it might hit you a little differently. So as always, thank you for tuning in. Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. Hello, and welcome to episode 136 of APM Success. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Dr. Stacia Dearman for the first of two episodes talking about the experience of a physician in the event of an adverse outcome or a malpractice claim. And this is going to be a little bit more of a, a somber discussion, but a very important one that I'm eager to bring to the APM Success mm -hmm. audience. So Dr. Dearman, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So you are uh, pediatrics and emergency medicine is your background, which yeah. is, you know, a, a place where, you know, you got to make a lot of split second decisions and the stakes are very high. Obviously, lots of medicine is like that. Anesthesia mm -hmm. is very much like that as well. So talk a little bit about your background and sort of how you came to be an expert in the topic at hand today. Uh, well, it's kind of the topic that nobody wants to become an expert in probably. Um, I... As you mentioned, I practiced in the context of pediatric emergency medicine for some years, primarily in uh, emergency department in a community hospital, and then for some years in the emergency department at a children's hospital. And uh, like most people in pediatrics, found my way there because I do genuinely love infants, children, and young adults. And some years ago, had an experience where I took care of a young woman on a Friday afternoon. Actually, I have very clear memories of these events. It was a Friday afternoon. She came in in the middle of the day. I took care of her over the course of five or six hours, did a variety of tests, ultimately concluded together with her and her parent that she was stable, took a home and discharged her home. And then came back to work on Saturday evening at five. And when I did, a specialist from another area of the hospital, an ENT, came to see me to let me know that one of the patients I'd seen the day before was now in the ICU. And honestly, I couldn't imagine who it would be. Well, as it turned out, it was this young woman. She had been at home and had arrested at home on Saturday afternoon. She stopped breathing. Her parents called 911. The EMS personnel did not have success securing an airway. She was transferred to a freestanding ER near her home where they did not have success securing her airway, a skilled team. And she was ultimately flown to the ICU at the hospital where I was working at the time where the CNT secured an airway. Uh, but as your audience who are anesthesiologists, I'm sure can imagine by that point, quite a bit of time had elapsed. And as soon as he gave me this news, I knew this is just not good. Her prognosis is either that she is going to die or will live with really quite significant brain damage. So I was really pretty stunned. When I think back on that moment, I can re recall just feeling kind of an out-of-body sensation, like a little bit dissociated, uh, kind of like the feeling I've had when I've gotten the news that someone I love has died. And uh, 
just couldn't believe what this person was telling me. He was kind of a guy who liked to joke around. And when he first told me this, my first thought was, why? He's like joking around. Why is he saying this? <clears throat> and then I thought, that's impossible. How would he know I had this patient yesterday? So it was the beginning of uh, quite a long journey for me. I really was crushed by what had happened to this young woman. Not surprisingly, she died a few days later. I struggled with questions around whether I held culpability for a long time, questions around whether I was responsible for the death of a young person were just very, very painful for me. And along with that came a, you know, a profound sense of guilt on and off, a lot of shame, a lot of grief, some sleepless nights. Um, it, was, it was a very hard time. I was blessed to be working in an apartment where I'd been for probably 13 years or so at that point. And I was, I was uh, a beloved member of the department. I can say I had close relationships with nurses and with colleagues, and there were people who stepped up to offer me, you know, words of comfort. They saw that I was suffering, uh, but that did not change the fact that that it was just a really difficult time. So, and not surprisingly, about a year later, her parents filed a lawsuit against me. I was the lead defendant. I was not the only defendant, but I was the one most in the hot seat. That process stretched over about a two and a half year time period. And I went to trial almost exactly to the day, three and a half years after she died and was at trial for three weeks. Hmm. And ultimately, the jury returned a verdict in my favor, but that did not erase everything that I had been through. Um, and uh, the, there was a lot of healing still to come even after that process. So it was in the midst, I will just throw out, it was in the midst of that experience, the, the trial that I stumbled upon information around the fact that we have a problem with physician suicide in the United States and found myself the next morning in the elevator on the way up to the courtroom with my lawyer saying to them, I am not sure what all the factors are that lead physicians to contemplate suicide, but I'm sure that what I'm experiencing has to be one of them. And in fact, yeah. I now know there is literature out there. There are plenty of stories and, uh, and that is a reality for some people. And so I think it was actually in the middle of the trial that I realized I have to make something good out of this awful, awful, awful experience. Mm. And so my the work I do now with Thrive around, you know, educating and supporting other physicians was born in the elevator on the way to the courtroom. <laughs> so for our listeners, um, apmsuccess.com slash 136. This is episode 136. We'll link to Dr. Dearman's website, a lot of her work, her blog. And uh, you can find a lot of resources pertaining to today's discussion there in the show notes. So in this one year period, you know, between this adverse yeah. outcome that you experienced, obviously you're kind of, pro at first you're just dazed and having this, you, as you described it, like a dissociative experience that lasted for some time. And then did you find there was some like emotional progress that was happening in that 12 months? Or were you kind of waiting for the shoe to drop? Did you, was it on your radar that there may be legal, re, uh, legal ramifications to this? Well, I think I was immediately, absolutely, it was immediately apparent to me that I might be sued. I think as I was standing there hearing this person say she arrested at home, uh, I think as physicians, we're in the United States, we're very aware that we can be sued. And I think we get a lot of messages, some more helpful than others, in the midst of our training about all the things we have to do to avoid being sued. We don't get enough messages around in my opinion, around the fact that it's likely that we will be and what to do if we are and so forth, right? But yeah. I was immediately aware that I could be sued. And definitely that was one stressor, that fear, not just around being sued, but I think like many physicians, I had an onset of fear around what will my colleagues think? 
will people lose respect for me as a physician because this happened? Um, is there a risk? I mean, I was the assistant medical director of my department, so I was well established there. And even so, I was having questions around, could I lose my job over this? Will people you know, speak ill of me about this? There was a lot of fear about that sort of a ramification. Um, and I think emotionally, looking back on that time, I was surprised by how slowly healing came. Hmm. I think, and I now know that is actually extremely common. There actually came a time where I was sort of beating myself up over the fact that I wasn't already feeling better. Because I think we have this idea that somehow in medicine, we should be able to encounter difficult patient events and shed them like water off the back of a duck. Mm -hmm. So when we can't, then we feel like that somehow means that we're insufficient, right? We're too weak. Maybe we didn't belong in medicine to start with. I wondered if I was smart enough, if I ever should have become a doctor. And all of that, you know, running very contrary to all the messages I'd gotten all along from colleagues and parents and so forth. But still, all those questions came up. Yeah, three and a half years, I think. Was that the number that you said from the time that yeah. the event happened to the time that you're in the courtroom? That That's a long time to have a cloud hanging over your head like that. I, I can't imagine what that must have been like. Yeah, it is a long time. And that is absolutely typical, really, uh, that these processes take a very long time. But you're exactly right. It kind of makes you feel like you're in a state of emergency. That's just dragging on yeah. forever, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as you reflected on sort of the, and you, you mentioned this briefly before, I'm curious, were there any tools or, or are there any, is, th is this part of the, uh, you know, cause it, I'm obviously I do physician finances and, and that type of thing. And one of the jokes that we have is like, oh, doctors are utterly unprepared financially for what they're going to experience once they finish training. I'm curious what your experience was looking back and having walked this road were there any resources or did you feel prepared in any way, either formally or informally, to, you know, go, go through this uh, really difficult situation? No, I, I did not really have preparation. Uh, I, I would say I did not have preparation in that regard, which is part of what I, why I feel so strongly about the need for learning and teaching in this domain because I wasn't prepared for it. I would say as far as resources, I was blessed to have a couple of colleagues. One, I felt I went to my medical director. I kind of was his right-hand person and I felt like he needed to know. And to a colleague who was also a bit of a mentor, a couple years mm -hmm. out, you know, out a couple years earlier than I from training. Mm -hmm. And talked it over with both of them. And thankfully, they were able to be sensitive and supportive and were able to hear what had happened and say, I wouldn't have done anything differently, Stacia. So that was helpful. It didn't change the fact that I felt like if I was there with that patient, I should have noticed something, right? But it at least helped to know that no one came back to me with, oh, well, clearly you dropped the ball when, <laughs> right? Um, and I would say some of the more meaningful words came from that mentor friend colleague who simply said, you know, you're an excellent doctor, right? At that moment, I really did not know that, Dustin. I had really lost track of that. And so to have her say that was helpful. I still was a long way from, I think, really believing it again, but it was good that she thought so. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's helpful that she thought so. And then I would say it was somewhat by chance or by the design of the universe that probably nine or 10 months after my patient died, somewhat by chance, I stumbled upon an article that was published in the year 2000 in the British Medical Journal by an internist from Johns Hopkins named Dr. Albert Wu. He wrote an article describing the experience of physicians in response to 
having made some type of error or thinking they've made some type of error. It was a very beautiful personal little essay. And in that article, he described or he coined the term really second victim to refer to the person who is injured when the patient they're caring for has something bad happen. Mm -hmm. And this physician, for example, is wondering whether they could have prevented it or might have caused it. I found that article so powerful because he described exactly what I felt. And I Mm -hmm. thought, ah, well, if he, who I have never met, can describe exactly what I've been feeling, then it doesn't reflect that something's wrong with me, it means that this experience that I'm having, it's embedded in the work. And that's really what I've come to see over time. It's part of the work. The other thing that I found so powerful in that little essay is that he said something to the effect that in his experience, those who felt this injury most deeply were often those who were what he called our most self-reflective colleagues. And I thought, you know, that's really beautiful because I do know that I'm reflective and realizing that maybe I was hurting because I had certain strengths rather than because I was flawed Mm -hmm. was, I would say, a first step in the direction of of healing for me. Definitely. I'm curious when you got the news that there was going to be a a formal lawsuit, did you find some sense of like, at least now it's not unknown anymore? There's a uh, a certainty to the path forward, or was it just uh, continual emotional carnage for you? Uh, I can't say that it really decreased my stress. Um, by that point, I was maybe starting to manage some of the emotions that had initially arisen better, um, and I, you know, I continued to work su- successfully all throughout. I felt a little nervous going to meet my defense lawyer for the first time. I had gotten a letter. Uh, Well, of course, I was served with papers that indicated I was being sued. And then I got a letter from the large physician group that I was a part of at the time, directing me to make an appointment with a particular defense lawyer in, you know, the center of the city where I was living at the time. So I went down to meet this person. I felt nervous, like I was being sent to the principal's office. (laughs) But the good news is, as soon as I met him, my impression was, this is someone who knows what he's doing. And I I felt a sense that I trusted him, Mm. right? And I would say many physicians I talk with do report to me that they have good experiences with their defense lawyers. Some occasionally not, but mostly I think the people who do malpractice defense are pretty interesting, smart bunch of lawyers. Yeah. And this this person definitely was. He was uh, smart and strategic. And right at our first meeting, I was very forthright with him about how painful it was for me that this had happened to my patient, how seriously I took what I do, mm-hmm. and you know how, how important it was to me to get good guidance in navigating it. But you know, it felt like I wanted to navigate it with the best integrity I could, but that it was really kind of frightening, frankly. Yeah. So next week, we're going to talk about the sort of mechanics and the, the logistical procedure around this type of you know, process. But I'm curious, for, for your experience as the trial was starting, you know, mm-hmm. walking into, a, was it a courtroom with a jury? Like, yes, wh- how, right. was, how did you kind of experience that? Well, it was intense. Uh, it was very intense. And I can only say that I got through that time, really the whole three and a half years, but especially the the period leading up to trial and the three and a, the three weeks of trial, I got through that just kind of one step at a time, constantly looking for, like if I felt my anxiety ramping up, I would ask myself, is there something I can do about this right now? And like, what would that be if I've got, you know, a stack of depositions I'm supposed to read through, then let's sit down and read them. Mm-hmm. If there was nothing that I saw that I could do right then, then it was time to do something else to bring my my blood pressure down, like yeah. take a walk, right? I cannot tell you how many miles I walked over the three weeks of trial. 
<laughs> when I wasn't in the courtroom, a lot of the time I was walking. Yeah. And uh, it just, that's what helped me. So I would say it was very intense. I had a bit of a, like a eureka moment a few minutes, a few weeks before the trial. I was feeling really nervous about testifying before a jury. Um, but at one point, it's kind of crazy, I was listening to an audiobook of the fourth volume of the Harry Potter series, Driving yes. to Work. <laughs> and that, I think, is called Goblet of Fire. My children had been trying to persuade me to read these books forever. So I'm listening to the fourth volume of Harry Potter. And in this particular moment, when I was driving down the highway commuting, Harry is about to face a dragon. And he is afraid. He's the youngest competitor. It feels like it's not fair that he's about to face a dragon. He can't figure out how he's going to either kill the dragon or blind the dragon or what he's going to be able to do. And he and his friends are searching frantically for some kind of a spell that he can use to dominate this dragon. When he suddenly gets some good advice that he needs to do what he already does best. And in Harry's case, that's flying. And he already knows and has mastered a spell that he can use to call his special flight groom to him. So he has this insight that as he faces this dragon, he needs to do what he already does best. So I literally can clearly remember I'm going around a certain curve on the interstate when my light bulb went off over my head and I thought, ah, I know already how to speak to, let's say, a room full of grandparents, aunts, and uncles mm -hmm. in the room of a very sick child in lay people's terms. I know how to engage a group of lay people and explain medicine in lay person's terminology. And that is what is expected of me on the witness mm -hmm. stand. I have to look at those 12 people who will not be medical people, most likely, and establish rapport with them, let them see who I am and what strengths I bring into my work and trust that they can understand what I'm trying to say. So having that insight was helpful. Um, and when I got up to testify, I mean, that's exactly what I did. I just tried to imagine that the jurors were parents, aunts, and uncles and, uh, and talk to them as such. Yeah. So in a trial like this, there's the direct examination where you got your the friendly mm -hmm. lawyer telling you to tell your story, and then you've got the mm -hmm. cross examination, which I only know yes. because I did mock trial in high school, where the opposing oh. counsel comes up and they try to nail you to the wall, yeah. um, and they impugn your character and they question your judgment and they try to put doubt in the minds of the jury that you are uh, an ethical, well-trained professional uh, physician. Right. So. Tell me about sort of how the direct went and then when the tide turned, what the cross exam was like for you. Well, my lawyer and I had spent, I actually had two lawyers. They worked as a team of two, but there was really one who was mostly examining me on the witness stand. And we had spent many hours preparing together. And I would say to any physician or other healthcare professional who's going through litigation, the time you spend preparing with your lawyer is gold and mm -hmm. don't shortchange it. So he and I had spent a lot of time preparing together and I'd had some experience with the plaintiff's attorney in the context of my deposition, right? Which is also a place where that opposing attorney is questioning you, not always in a pleasant manner and trying to throw you off your game. So I had that experience under my belt, uh, although I am clearly sort of a verbally oriented person. My lawyer had said many, many times that when I was under cross-examination, I was to be very brief and that if anything needed clarification, he would get back up on what's called recross and clarify, right? Mm -hmm. So we went through the whole direct examination and that went fine. And then the uh, cross-examination began. And I think you're right. There is always going to be an attempt you know, if I wrapped my mind before I went into it around the fact that what I have to bring to the witness stand are strengths I already possess, right? My intelligence, my compassion, my diligence, all those things have to be apparent to the jury because that's what, that's who I am and that's who they need to seek to understand the situation. Yeah. So that 
opposing attorney is going to try to portray us as physicians on the stand as the anti-doctor, right? The not compassionate, the not diligent, the unintelligent, the the arrogant rather than humble, right? All those things. And uh, I just had to be very clear in my own head about who I know that I am Hmm. without being arrogant, just being, you know, clear about who I believe myself to be and then stand my ground. I mean, there were moments where he did what many of these opposing attorneys do and tried to throw a document up on a screen for the jury to see when I had never seen that document. Like it's a reference I didn't even know existed, right? Uh, Trying to sort of ambush me. Um, And I just was very frank. And I said, I've never seen that document before. Would you turn your screen so I can see it? Which he would not do. So then eventually he took it down. (laughs) Mm. So yes, it's difficult and it is like being in a pressure cooker, basically. Yeah. You're waiting for somebody to let the pressure out. <laughs> yeah. So I, I will say by the end of the trial, you know, the jury goes out to deliberate. I knew I had done my best at that point over those three weeks. I had tried to be as professional as I could, as prepared as I could, and just to do my best on the witness stand. So by the point that the jury went out to deliberate, at some level, I was at peace. Like I knew that I couldn't know what their verdict was going to be, but I had heard the expert testimony on both sides. And at that point, I was at peace that I thought I had done the best I could in caring for my patient. And I had done my best at trial and that outcome was beyond my control. Right. Mm-hmm. And I and I could accept that, that whatever the outcome was, there was nothing else I could do. Yeah. So you mentioned the outcome was favorable for you, and yet there was still a significant emotional burden that it has it took you a long time, not only a long time to process, but that I think reoriented your your career and your life in a pretty fundamental and unpredictable way. So talk about the process, you know, post trial walking through that and how did you, you know, as you began to unpack what the the second victim effect mm-hmm. means for you and the way that you've wanted to now kind of reshape your vocation to serve physicians who are going through these challenges? Yeah. So, well, I did continue in clinical practice in pediatric emergency medicine until uh, maybe a little over a year ago. So, for another five or six years beyond these events, I continued to practice. And I think sort of the first and most obvious thing I wanted for myself was to be happy again in practicing. Mm -hmm. And that just took time and attention to how I was directing my thoughts and uh, attention to kind of processing the emotions. I would compare the sort of long-term stressor of a malpractice lawsuit to other kinds of long-term stressors. Like let's say someone we love develops a a chronic, ultimately terminal disease, like certain cancers or uh, dementia, right? And we are in it with them, particularly if we're their caregiver. Mm -hmm. That stress builds up in our bodies over time. And just because that story ends, the stress doesn't vanish overnight. We have to find ways to release it, whether that's through contact with other people who are supportive to us or physical activity. I mean, there are just a thousand and one ways, you know, working with a psychologist or a coach, there are a thousand and one ways we can feel better, but we have to make the choice to try to move the pendulum in that direction. The other thing that I did start doing right away when I, you know, had this insight that, okay, I'm going to try to make something beautiful out of all this ugly, the place I decided to begin was with public speaking. And I still do public speaking to this day. So within about six months, I did a public speaking engagement, uh, like a two hour CME at the hospital where I was employed at the time. It was Uh, directed at my division of pediatric emergency services, but other physicians from other parts of the hospital were invited as well. And my lawyer came along. So it was like the two of us giving the two sides of the story. And I was scared to death, but it was Mm -hmm. like, I felt like I needed to do it, right? 
Well, by the end of that presentation, you know, one of my colleagues was tearful. Um, others had asked poignant questions. And by the end of that presentation, I felt very clear, like, oh, I was really right to do this. This, this is a need that I am well equipped to fulfill. So I continued to do public speaking from that point forward and then ultimately to build my work with Thrive. And I think it has also helped me to thrive to do that, right? To take those lemons and make lemonade, it's always good for us in life. Uh, yeah. Psychologists call it post-traumatic growth. So it's it's a known thing. <laughs> and and it's a real thing, right? Yeah. So describe your current, what, what Thrive looks like today. So Thrive really is uh, a business entity by which I conduct a variety of activities. I provide some education through public speaking and also an online CMA course that is aimed at physicians or other healthcare workers who are in malpractice litigation moving in the direction of deposition. So as of right now, that course is targeted at those early stages of malpractice litigation. And mm -hmm. it's my intent over the next couple of months to build it out to cover all of malpractice, the whole process, all the way to trial. But for right now, it's called Deposition Magic because of my Harry Potter experience. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love it. <laughs> like, here's room, people. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so there's that online CME course. And then I also came to realize that there are people who just need someone to talk with one-on-one -on -one to brainstorm their best way through these processes. So I became certified as a professional coach, what's called a whole person certified coach, which is a type of an international coaching federation aligned training. Uh, and I work with people one-on-one -on -one and do also a lot of work like interactive teaching and learning in retreat settings. So physician hmm. retreats are, are a real joy to me because these experiences around hard patient outcomes are something we just don't talk about. Yeah. But when you get in a group and start to talk about it, everybody knows it at some level, right? Yeah. yeah. It's familiar territory. I um, Brief personal aside before I ask another yeah. question. I, I somehow managed to make it to 30 years old without reading Harry Potter, but my <laughs> wife is a... Uh, but loves Harry Potter and has read the books many times over. And so after we got married, I was like, there's a part of my wife I'm not going to understand until I experience <laughs> until this. You so read these books. I'm glad that I did. So I know that we're talking about, you know, the Triwizard <laughs> Tournament where Harry has to yeah. do what he has to do. And great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm curious, what has surprised you? You know, you've interacted with many physicians who go through a deeply traumatic, deeply personal, difficult, and something they don't want to talk about. And, and you have this unique window into seeing, you know, a, a lot of people's very deep pain. What what has surprised you in having conversations with doctors in this place? Well, I guess I would say what I don't even know if it's surprised me as much as it's moved me how deeply physicians as a group on average care about their patients. Right? That the, the vulnerability to this kind of emotional injury is a direct result of the strengths of compassion and diligence, particularly, and I think humility. So we feel so deeply what happens to our patients that sometimes it can throw us off course. But mm -hmm. ultimately, that is a reflection, whether or not this is the word we would choose, it's a reflection of our love for our patients. Right. So that moves me deeply. And then what fascinates me is to see the different courses people follow after these kinds of events. Now, there is a body, a whole body of research that has emerged in healthcare since that initial article was published in 2000 by Albert Wu around the experience of nurses, physicians, and other healthcare workers who are injured when something bad happens to their patient. And that body of research identified fairly early on that down the road, some people drop out, which can be 
functional. It may be that they like shift roles, for example. They drop out of their current environment, um, but can also be not functional. Like it could mean untreated depression or untreated addiction or even suicide, right? There are those who survive, which means they kind of limp along and, and hang in there, but they're suffering inside. And then there are those who thrive. And and hence, I you know, named what I, the work I do thrive for this reason, because it's those people who thrive, who have somehow one way or another found a way to take what was painful for them and pull something positive out of it. Mm-hmm. And that can vary enormously. It could be uh, that I'm going to ensure that every resident who comes through my OR understands what to do in the event that ketamine produces laryngospasm. Mm. Okay. It could be something as simple as that. It could be teaching about a certain condition. It could be getting involved with some sort of quality and safety initiative at the institution where we work, uh, or it could be something more out in the community. But that notion that people can go from this very painful place to being stronger and better is very moving to me. It doesn't mean that the injury vanishes completely. Mm -hmm. I will always be the person who had that experience, but I can actually look back on it now and say, I'm better for it. If it had to happen, I'm kind of grateful. I'm the one it happened to, if that makes sense. Yeah. In closing, is there, you know, as you look at the conversations that you've had with physicians and the stories that you've heard, Mm -hmm. is there anything that characterizes or you found characterizes the physicians who ultimately are able to process as best they can and get back to a place of Mm -hmm. thriving, perhaps Mm -hmm. with an even greater degree of empathy? And, you know, we, we have these scars in life, the difficulties that we go through, and it makes us, you know... Hopefully, it, it makes us realize that other people hurt too, and, and it does sort of yeah. broaden your perspective and make you connect on the human level a little more. Are there any either practices or character traits or anything like that that you find characterizes doctors who are able to ultimately come full circle on this? Uh, there, are, there probably are a few. The first thing that comes to mind, which is so hard for us in a time where we're feeling guilty and ashamed, is that the people who heal the best. The research has shown that the, I guess I should say the factor that predicts who will heal the best is social support. So finding a way to get the support you need is really essential to healing. It's just really essential. Hmm. I think people who do well often either come into their experience with a mentality or at some point adopt a mentality that this is terrible and I'm going to just accept that it's happened and I'm going to open my mind to the idea that something good might come of it. Could something good come out of this? Some people like to quote the question, uh, instead of thinking this is happening to me, could I imagine that it's happening for me? And I think the people who are able to find further paths to growth and connection frequently are, they've just cracked the door open a little bit to the idea that maybe this is happening for me. Hmm. And then I think the other thing is that we really, if we're, if we're blaming or criticizing ourselves at all, at some point, we have to find a way to engage with self-forgiveness. And that can come in a lot of forms. For some people, it may come in the form of doing something that feels like righting a wrong or restitution. And there are sometimes appropriate moments for that. It might, for some people, come in the form of a spiritual or a religious practice. Uh, Like, for me personally, honestly, I was 
so ashamed and felt so terrible about this young woman's death. There eventually came a moment where I just started praying that, you know, to God as I understand God, to please forgive me if I had failed one of God's children. And I think by praying that over and over, eventually what actually happened is I was able to forgive myself. I was able to acknowledge my humanity and be okay with the fact that I'm human. So I would say to physicians going through this kind of thing, the thing I would most like for them to know is that they may be feeling like they got into this situation because they're a bad doctor or they were just a bad doctor in one particular moment. And what I would really like for them to know is that they got into this situation because they are the person who's willing to be courageous enough to learn what has to be learned, knowledge-wise, skills-wise, and get in there and do what has to be done to take care of other people. Not everybody's willing to, to be brave in that way. And uh, so if you're hurting after this kind of experience, it's it's actually as a result of your courage. And uh, you got to tap into that courage as you move on through it. If our listeners want to find out more, hear more about you, get in touch with <laughs> you, Dr. Dearman, what's the best way for them to either find you or reach out? Easily at my website. That would be the best place. And that is www.thrivephysician, all one word, dot com. Uh, they'll find my blog there. They can uh, connect with me via email. I read all my own emails, so they're welcome to reach out to me there. And the online CME course is there. And if they want me to come speak, you know, at their hospital or whatever, or to their medical group, I'm very happy to do that. They can reach out to me in that regard there as well. Dr. Dearman, thank you for taking the time to share your story. And uh, I, I hope that there's people out there that are listening to this that are desperately looking for resources who are able to now make progress in this very difficult facet of providing medical care to people. And the reality is that, you know, doctors who see many patients, these things happen. And I'm so, I'm great as a physician spouse. I, you know, I think about what my wife goes through and I'm glad that there's people like you out there to equip doctors to hopefully work through these things and to ultimately find thriving on the other end. So thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. If you liked what you heard this week, head on over to apmsuccess.com, where you can find more content and free resources to help you build a successful career in anesthesia and pain management. If you wanted to leave a review in iTunes, I'd also really appreciate it. Thanks for using some of your valuable time to join me today on APM Success.